because our next speaker is a really interesting person. He left a corporate career behind because he decided that he wants to make an impact. And so he founded a social enterprise which produces tailor-made suits. 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 And it's, it's really interesting because it's an Austrian enterprise founded by a German based in Hungary. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so yeah, let's see what he will tell us about his like really brave step, as I find. And so please welcome with me, Michael Biss. Thank you very much. So, rethinking social. Why do I think it's important on a conference that is about digitalization? I think the reason is that like any industrial revolution, digitalization changes the workforce. But unlike any revolution before, it is diametrically changing the skill requirements of the workforce. The jobs that are getting eliminated are manual jobs, low cognitive skill requirements, and the jobs that are created are up in the top corner really requiring high cognitive skills. So we find the problem that a lot of the people who are losing jobs have little to no chance to move into the new jobs that are being created. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we doing with those that are left behind? And all of you have heard of the upcoming topic constantly about basic income. And from a social perspective, I think that's fair because we are eliminating jobs, we are benefiting as society. So it makes sense to give something back to those that are left behind. But what this is keeping forgetting all the time is the impact of having a job on yourself, the pride that you're taking from contributing, the self-worth that all of us are taking from having a meaningful job. And so we believe that you know it's rather about creating new manual jobs that provide a meaningful income. And this is what a lot of social enterprises are doing. So this is why it's important to think about how to make them cost effective. And one of those social enterprises is the Taylor Network. That's what we're doing. We're providing tailor-made suits that are unique, of high quality, perfectly fitting, and come at the price of an off-the-shelf, uh, mass-produced, branded suit, like, for instance, Super Boss. Now I can say it, I know. Um, so what we do is our suits are entirely designed. You can customize them up to 25 design elements. They are high quality. They're perfectly fit because we come to you, we take your measurements to ensure that in the end you have the perfect product at the price of a standard product. And you're asking where's the social impact? 90% of the experienced tailors that we're working with are 50 plus and are living in the countryside. They've been struggling with the downturn in the economic, um, especially the textile industry in the last couple of years. Some of them still have tailoring shops that are really struggling to get demand and others have been moving into low paying jobs and are really struggling. And now we're empowering to bring these decades of experience that they have in the industry back to do what they love and make a meaningful income out of this. But we've even said, you know, we can take it further. We can create more impact. So um, as we said, I come from corporate career, so does my management team. So we've taken the experience that we have and we've really segmented the tailoring process using all the standard tools of um, core knowledge, centralization, of specialization, etc., to make the job so easy that we are creating a three month um, course together with our NGO partners. We're training less educated women in transition homes. And transition homes are places where families that are down on their luck go and live for a year and a half to be reintegrated into society. And we take those women um, that are willing to change themselves and we train them within three months to generate, in the beginning, man's pants. That's the simplest part of a suit. And so within three months, we train them to get meaningful and sustainable income, to break the poverty cycle, and contribute again. And in general, it looks like we're on a great track because the market is there. This is a study in 2017 that caused a lot of outcry, saying, wow, 2018 is going to be the year of the social revolution. The social conscious customer is finally there. Because 60% of the people said, yes, you know, we should support social enterprises. And even 64% were given as, you know, actually buying. But these 64% are of the 60% that already said, yes, you should buy. 
So that means only 38% of the people are buying uh, actually one piece, just one piece for an entire year from any of the thousands of socially conscious companies. And the future is not even looking much better. Only 12% said, yes, I want to spend more in the upcoming year on socially conscious products. So this is really a big problem. And the question is why? And I found a very unpopular study that is speaking about you know, the effect of price sensitivity of green products. And green and social, we have the same target groups, often similar motivations. So it's applying to us, I think, as well. And it shows that you know, as soon as the product is priced at the same level, but it's better because it's green, people are happy to take it. But as soon as you start applying the normal thing every social enterprise does, you put a premium on top of it because you have higher costs, the interest to buy goes down. So at the level of like 20, 25%, you're in a niche market of maybe 5% willing to buy your products. So you might say, well, 20, 25% on top of that, that sounds like you're just trying to take a lot of profit away with you know, being social. But that's not true. If you look at our example, we're in the garment industry, the average labor cost of a, one of the pieces that you're wearing is probably between two and five percent of the price of what you're paying is just going to the people who produce it. So for us, that's totally different. Depending on which benchmark you take, we're probably paying 11 times as much per hour as the companies that are producing in Asia. So if we want not to end up in a niche market, if we want to be competing with the entire market, if we want to keep the price, we have to figure out where to take 20% of the final price out of our value chain. And that's not easy, and the question is how do we do it? Um, what we've seen before in the numbers is that a lot of people are actually, they're not willing to buy your products, but they seem to be willing to support socially conscious products. It's, um, we've seen it last night at, at the event where we were able to help another social enterprise. People are really enjoying helping. Um, it gives you a totally different reward than paying more for a product, but helping is great. Paying more is not so great. So what we need to see is where can we find charitable support inside our value chain to make our products competitive. There's a great example in South Africa. Um, it's called the tea bag company. They are using used tea bags to produce a lot of artisanal products. It's amazing, they're getting donations from all over the world. They've partnered with big uh, hospitality companies who are sending all their used tea bags to them to let them produce. So they manage to scale. Um, and there are even some examples in the fashion industry that are using recycled uh, materials. But as you can see, we are about quality suits, so that's not really for us. So we need to look somewhere else. When you look into production overheads, because of the What's in it, and because of the value of it, is also not a lot of potential. Yes, we get some benefits from um, discount rate on legal and consulting fees, etc. But this is not where the where the money is. The money is for every social enterprise, I think, in branding. This is where, if you look at your garments, over fifty percent of the cost of your whatever you're wearing goes into branding and margin. And if we're talking about branding, we're talking a lot of the money goes into advertising, especially in the fashion industry. We're talking TV ads, we're talking um, digital ads. And we as a social enterprise, if we want to be price competitive with our production costs, we can't do this. So we have to find another way. And we're thinking, okay, where do we find the right audience in the right mood for a tailor-made suit? Where are the people that, are, that might wear suits? And where are they thinking about suits? And we figured out it's at work. This is where they wear a suit. This is where they see other people wearing a suit. So maybe this is where we should go. And what we did is we developed an in-house tailoring program where we are partnering with multinational companies. Um, we already partnered with BlackRock, uh, Morgan Stanley, we're in talks with uh, KPMG, with uh, Boston Consulting Group, Citigroup, and other multinationals. And the benefit for those is CSR is becoming more and more important. CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, is also becoming more important as millennials care more and more about the companies they work for. So most of these companies are spending a lot of effort on CSR activities, and this is where we come in. And all we need is uh, the top management support who really pushes the message out and says, hey, we're inviting this team in because they have a great social impact. 
we need um, an office space where the people can drop their pants during the fitting exercises. Um, and for the company, it has a great, it have a great CSR benefit. For the employees, it's a convenience benefit because they get better quality, perfect fitting, and all at the price of its um, off the shelf standard suit. And for our people, it's the benefit we grow demand, we grow impact, we can help more and more people breaking the poverty cycle. So this is why we're doing this in-house um, program. It's great, we're usually going into the company with an ambassador program where the people um, take fabric samples, the first movers usually start talking about it, they love the suit and so we grow. And this way we avoid advertising and are price competitive. And I want to use this example for you to really start thinking about if you're doing anything with social, where in your setup are benefits? I think every social company has some benefits where they can work harder to decrease their costs and become price competitive despite having a huge impact. But what's very important is never forget, if you're running on the social enterprise benefit, you have to really believe in it. You really have to act consistently accordingly. It's not a marketing fact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very clear and very understandable explanations about what you are doing. I really, really love the idea and I'm, Thank you. I was just sitting there like I, I, I really couldn't get it. I, I, I love it so much. And I'm also really interested what you think about it and if you have any questions. My, yeah, okay, so there is one question from Christian. Yeah. Hi, thank you for talk. Um, my question is, um, uh, the first point in how you do sales is uh, you have to get uh, the C-level on your, on your side. Uh, well, every B2B company uh, wants exactly that. Um, how is it easier than the other methods? Um, see, this is really, CSR is becoming for most of the multinational really a top priority. So. For us, it's actually surprisingly easy. The first BlackRock, um, they came to me, I was posting on, on LinkedIn about some of the things we did, and at some point, the CEO of BlackRock was writing me a message that like, sounds cool. Okay. And so um, I was like, if you think it's cool, then let's meet. And, and then it works a lot with referrals, etc. And as soon as we, as we really, people want to help. So for us, it's a lot about networking. It's a lot about going to people saying, this is what we're doing. It's like the same reaction, you know, the people love usually what we're doing and they're like, okay, let me think, who do I know? And then that's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of hassling, but it's, it's going well. Thank you. There is one more question from Katharina. Hello, thanks for your talk. I just love what you do. And I just wonder, because you talk about value chains and what about the fabric? Is it did you think about uh, fair trade sign or, for example, for the cotton, or is it just too expensive, or what do you think about that? It's, it's a very valid point. So the problem is, it is very expensive. So we are at the moment fighting, you know, to, to keep our premium down. Um, what we will do once we are established is we will bring a separate line out and then have a premium on top of it. And then we will have to see that this is not a cost we could anymore absorb. That's Hi, I'm Gunnar. Uh, my question is, how tailored is your suit? Uh, totally. Totally? Totally. So we really, we have uh, a stylist coming in. The stylist is measuring you entirely on over 40 points. And then it's perfectly made to your measures. So you create, we create the um, unique pattern just for you. The new unique pattern goes to the tailor and he creates the on your measurements, on your pattern. Who creates the cut? Um, we do, that's in-house. So you have an algorithm, you have a digital... We have an algorithm behind it, plus we have very experienced pattern makers who do this. And you glue the front, or you have a half canvas, full canvas, how do you... At the moment we do predominantly half canvas. Mm -hmm. um, we're thinking about taking entirely the lining off for summer, but we're not there yet. Um, so it's half canvas at the moment. Interesting, thank you. So you seem to have another customer. <laughs> <laughs> I right? would like that. That's amazing. Um, are there any more questions? I, I was wondering, how, how many suits have you sold so much? We're just so starting, so we're in be below 100 yet. Okay. So we're, we're early stage. 
Now I, I see all these tailors, like mm -hmm. hundreds of tailors all over the world, and they're old and they have their philosophy of quality. How mm -hmm. do you assure they all work to, you know, your idea of how to stitch a hole, yeah. how to whatever, fix yeah. the arm? It is super intense. So we work with one regional supervisor per 10 tailors. So one, or engagement manager, I mean, they're not working for us, they're engagement managers. Um, and every new, t we are constantly taking the tailors um, inside. We're making workshops with them where we go through our method. And um, our handover document at the moment is like 10 pages where they have to sign off on every line item, especially once they're new. And then it becomes less and less paperwork that we're handing over to them. Plus we have um, a change document that is similar. So I think the benefit for us is we come from industries that work a lot with lean. So we're constantly working on this. What is the question? Sorry. Uh, what about uh, one second? Okay, sorry. <laughs> you make suits, uh, yeah. but do you think about the same project with sim uh, different products, or you are professional in suits making tailor makes? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, for there was an interesting talk yesterday that was speaking about delivery hero who sees them as a pizza service is stupid because what they produce is a network that can be used for yeah. so much more later, and that's exactly where we want to go. So. We start with suits because, um, sorry to break this to the people who wear suits, that's the highest margin garment in the industry. There's no garment which has more margin than the suit. Um, so we said, this is where we start, this is where we build an efficiency network. Um, and our target is once we have built this efficiency network, we actually want to take designers on because designers are struggling to get their fashion out. Um, if you go into a boutique and buy a designer piece, you pay for it three to four pieces because they need to always produce so much and throw it away. Um, so if we have that network can bring designers onto them, and we're going to bring a big win, not just to the tailors, we're going to bring a big win to designers. And we're actually thinking about revolutionizing at some point the boutique market because we could bring kind of an online store into the boutique. Um, but that's a long story then. Thank you. We're once more like great in time.